a truly successful creative director is equal parts a creative visionary, but equal parts sort of like a lover of process, a people, a team, like understanding, not necessarily a team person or a team player, but understanding their role and dynamic within a team, within team setting and being able to like manage that flow, creating systems around the unique people that you have in your group, but also understanding what the bottom line is. Welcome to Theoretically Speaking, hosted by Victoria Herrera and Brent Javier, produced by Next Theory. From the Philippines to the world, this is an interview series with creative entrepreneurs, tastemakers, and change agents. We dissect the journey they took from dream to reality, exchanging stories from the past, motivations in the present, to ideas for the future. Welcome to Theoretically Speaking, where we at Next Theory have another awesome conversation from someone we look up to, someone who's impacted our lives, and someone who inspired us creatively. And check this out. She's an experienced content creator with a demonstrated history working within the fashion, beauty, luxury, and lifestyle industries, strong media and communication professional, lover of humans, and the things they create. Excited by brand voice, storytelling, and consumer experiences, both digital and on ground. Familiar with both startup and corporate culture, evolving markets, and global trends. Believes that preparation, creativity, and positive attitude are the core of solution-based performance. Now, I can't think of another better person who captures all of that than Miss Sarah Meyer. Even before we start, that I am very happy and I want to say thank you for the time and I think we both have missed you. I always know that you're you're doing well and let's find out more about your story. Learn from your experiences and hopefully get some more insight. I also would like to start off by saying thank you to the both of you. Having removed myself from sort of like the nucleus of chaos that is Manila and moving first to Brooklyn and then now being in the Bay Area has been so instrumental in sort of where I've come on my journey. Easily for the past three years, it's been very touch and go in terms of staying in contact with people from what was sort of like a past life, right? I think that in that time, had you caught me maybe somewhere in the middle, I wouldn't have been at the place that I am now. Like there was a lot of like ups and downs, especially coming off of this last pregnancy. I mean, postpartum and it's been real. It's been really real in terms of finding my way. You know, when you're kind of past 35 and starting over again, you don't ever anticipate that you have to do that. And the tone on which I left Manila, I had just come out of a divorce, moving my teenage daughter halfway across the country into a marriage like Don and I had never lived together at this point. It was all so new. And so rediscovering my priorities in terms of being a creative, being a parent and a family uh, woman, my priorities in terms of like the Philippines is always finding its way into the core of my why and figuring out how to do that being so far away took a little time for me to rediscover the essence of why we do what we do. The two of you have been just such a huge, massive part of sort of all the iterations of creativity in my life. V at the gate and seeing you kind of like go through your life and your journey. And then us finally working together in the capacity of like the radio show, Philippine Fashion Week, the book, and then later on in She Talks. And then Brent, actually, I don't know if a lot of people know this. I give Brent a lot of credit for being able, able to pivot after this sort of like MTV and then like creative agency, uh, production company into the new phase of what would excite me. Brent got me into Fermata, was opening up this world of e-commerce and retail and creating on that front that I will say influenced more how I was sort of presenting myself on Instagram, which is eventually what got me hired to be editor-in-chief of Metro Magazine. So yeah, that's the the RBJ right there. That's, that's super sick. I had no idea. Yeah. But. So that's going to be the teaser clip. Just everything you said about <laughs> <laughs> That's our promo clip. <laughs> that's my new bio. I don't know what you yeah. talked about. That's my new bio. That's what I'm going to put on LinkedIn. Yeah. I'll be like, you don't know me? Listen to this clip about Sarah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. And so it's just so beautiful to see, you know, I mean, I don't know the last time that all three of us were together, that it was not a club. Yeah. Right? 
putting it in the context now, there's so many times where we were together, but we didn't like, hey guys, we're all together now. It was kind of like, oh yeah, so-and-so's there, so-and-so's there. And then now when you're stuck at home and you can't leave, now you're like, I miss people. Now when we see them, you'll feel it differently because those moments when we had together, those were pretty good, even though we thought they were normal. You know, I was thinking a little bit about how come we are the way we are, V, and I attribute a lot of that to kind of coming of age and the aura of this individual who is so, like at a very early stage, attuned to the law of attraction and magnetism and the power of determining and deciphering if something coming into your life is a test. But all the shit that kind of comes into your life, figuring out if now is the time to say yes, or if it's just kind of priming you for the time to actually say yes. Like how many things do you have to turn away and feel really crappy about? Because you know in your heart you wanted it, but you know like even deeper that if you say no to it this time, it's going to come around like for you, for you. Okay, let's start in the beginning. How was it for you growing up? And then how did you get into the industry? Growing up, my father is Swiss-Croatian, my mother is Filipina-Chinese. They met in Hong Kong because my dad was in retail uh, and my mom was a model. So my dad's kind of like this trendy Euro boy that's like out in Asia finding suppliers. So he's doing sourcing for Puma. You know, we're getting all like the new like tech and fabric and, you know, God, I remember all the crap that used to come into our house that I would like experiment on first. The Puma had like dial lace neoprene as like sort of like this mass consumer goods uh, fabric for the first time mesh like it was fun you know out of the philippines everybody wanted like mestiza looking models like they wanted sort of like the elite like spanish kind of white skinned representation you also kind of had to be from like a well-off family but my mom and her group they're all like very dusky skinned and you know with exotic eyes and reed thin and like crazy hair and nobody could quite place it and they ended up becoming that first generation of like supermodels, you know, all the Japanese designers in Tokyo, going to Australia, going to New York. So that was my upbringing. That was the world that I was born into. I thought it was normal for all my mom's gay designer friends to be in the house, like help Vidal Sassoon get his career started. And they were like tinkering with my hair all the time. That was normal to me. So much so that I wanted something else. But the lure of whatever this was, the industry was just really too strong to veer away from. So yeah, I kind of found my way back in it after a while. For reasons at the time, it was just like, I think I want to do this in order to get my next step, uh, which was really always to be MTV VJ. How did you land that MTV VJ gig? The, the very first time that Law of Attraction worked in my life to that degree, where it was like so undeniable, kind of slap in the face. So I had a pretty tumultuous sort of high school like home life, what was happening on the home front while I was in high school, that I started underperforming a lot academically. I was a straight A student when I got to high school and then it just kind of all started falling apart. And I started going to San Meg and to Mars. <laughs> and do you know what I mean? Like finding sort of like safety and kinship in the club scene. What happened sort of towards the tail end was I had lost complete faith in myself in my ability to sort of make it into a good school. And so that's playing small started where it's like, well, maybe, you know, maybe I won't go to school. Maybe I'll just stay here, right? Which was in the Philippines. But then I remember being in the guidance office at my high school one day and my guidance counselor, who, whose name is Victoria Herrera, believe it or not. <laughs> So the two most influential women in my life named Victoria Herrera. She saw me kind of leafing through college brochures and she's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm kind of like looking for where to apply to. And then she goes, come in here and told me the most mind blowing shit that like a faculty member could have ever told me. And it was, you know, you don't have to go to college, right? And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? She's like, not everybody has to go to college. Like, it's not for everybody. And then so in my head, my like internal narrative was like, she's saying I'm stupid. Like, it's a waste of my parents' money to send me to school. Like, all of these things, right, in my head. But now looking back, what she was really telling me was, it doesn't have to be a conventional path for you. If you feel like you're altering too much to conform to be in this trajectory, maybe it's not for you. Spread your wings a little bit, see where that takes you. And so that, you know, seeded in my head. So I didn't apply for anywhere, like no colleges at all. And then my dad got extremely upset and he made it extremely clear that he did not slave to send me to extremely expensive schools 
for fun. It was like, this was his gift to me. And he had, he had put so much premium on education. Not interestingly, necessarily because of the academics, but what I found out later on was it was for the network. He, at a very young age, was trying to instill in me, it's who you know. And so in kind of like this late rush, he was just like, you got to go somewhere. Akinea tests, entrance exams were coming about. I went in, didn't really take it very seriously and got in and was extremely disappointed actually that I got in because it meant that I had to go. Ateneo was a little bit rocky for me, just culturally, like a lot of people treated me very other. And so I dropped out. That's when I was like, okay, go to California, try that out. Then I was about to go to community college somewhere like in Pomona. And something was like, okay, go back home, go get your stuff, say bye to your family and move to Cali. That's when I went home that I met Joey at a Rahulara fashion show. My mom introduced me and he looked at me, he nodded and he goes, what do you want? I'm like, what do you mean? What do? He said, what, you know, you know what I'm saying. What do you want? And I was like, okay, I want to be an MTV VJ. And he goes, okay, come on board with me, do everything I say and it'll happen. In six months, I was an MTV VJ. And it was only because he allowed me to follow the path that I really wanted, which was to be a scriptwriter. He's like, what do you want more than anything? I was like, you know, I was supposed to, I had a, a scholarship for writing, didn't get to go. So he's like, okay, we have the Ford Supermodel Contest coming up, be scriptwriter for that. So I was scriptwriter for that. And then the host of the press conference didn't show up. He's like, who knows the script, day of. He's like, go find something to wear, you're hosting the show, because I had written it, right? And so I get up there. And you know, when you write something and you reviewed it so many times, because, oh my God, Audie was a perfectionist, I had memorized it. So I got up there and spat it out. And it just so happened that the crew for MTV Asia was in the audience. And the next week, I want to say, they're on the phone. Soon after that, I was in Singapore for an audition that they aired live. And then we signed. In my head, it was like, back then, you had to do the MTV VJ hunt to become a VJ. In my, there was like no other, they, you know, they said there's no other way. There's always another way, if it's meant to be. I was in the audience that night. I feel like I'm that little Kendrick Lamar watching Dr. Dre, right? Um, like, I was watching you right after you hosted. I think it was my mom who said, damn, Sarah's good. We all witnessed that, like the rest is history. You became one of the most watched MTV VJs that a lot of us saw growing up. If you can share with us, how was your experience when you were going through all of that? You know, when you've got flow, like when you're just in the zone, as I now realize like being in the zone and being on camera at the same time came with a lot of just other shit. Being more recognizable, being wanted to be at parties is sort of like social societal demand that I was happy to oblige and like kind of ride that wave. But when you don't have the foundation to handle shit like that, it can suck you up and, and sort of spit you out, which is I think eventually what happened when it ended up happening. I just want to ask during this phase though, you were getting a big network. Did your dad notice that? When I started MTV, that was 19, December 99, my dad saw a bit of it, right? And he passed away a few years after, and I found his hard drive. And his hard drive revealed a lot to me about his thought process as I was like embarking on this. He felt very let down that I had chosen to be a model. He thought it was a vanity thing. He thought I was seeking after my mother, who they're, they're divorced at the time. A lot of like sort of like bitter associations and was extremely concerned that I was going down the same path. It started changing, like his like entry started changing as, as time went by. I knew that he was proud when there was like this entire folder and he was keeping like every sort of newspaper article about me. The access to a lot of different people opened up much more just because the nature of MTV, like, you know, we were in Singapore one day and then Jakarta the next, Bangkok, and then, you know, doing that traveling back and forth and constantly hopping around Asia. Asia became the playground, no longer just sort of Manila, right? And they expanded, which hopefully, hopefully that made him happy. From my own experience, my dad's a doctor, right? Normally someone that becomes a model, it's like, my dad's probably like, what the fuck? Same thing. Like I saw him one time, he had like a dog tag with my face on it i'm like the hell? <laughs> but it's cute right so i'm sure your dad was like for sure you know just didn't know how to communicate it maybe as well but yeah. yeah so it brings me back to what we were talking about earlier you were in your flow being the host of mtv asia being in the industry and working everywhere and then 
we're going to circle back now to that story of you and Top Model. Yeah, so one thing that Joey always taught us, I think he just drilled this into our head, was be happy. He always just said be happy, which sounds so kind of like frivolous, but unknowingly that be happy was a lot of like crazy ass internal work to get to what he meant as happy. It wasn't this kind of like surface happy. It was like sort your shit out and be in a state where you are able to receive all this goodness that you are you know, generating by being in your flow, by being in your zone. Then it was a matter of, you know, I had become very, very specific in my vision boarding and it was coming down to a point where I was almost like Revo Naval status. And then I saw your sister's vision board for me. Extremely, extremely pivotal in building my career into what it was. Her vision board for me had Next Top Model as a host on it. And so this was like the huge lesson because it was like, okay, I had become so good at manifesting things that I tried to manifest her vision for me as well. And it wasn't happening. And I was like, what's wrong here? Didn't think anything of it. Just keep going with the flow until that kind of wave had passed. And then I was going through all this shit in my personal life. And then the offer came. Then it was like, okay, we have an audition for Philippine Next Top Model for you as the main host. And I went to the audition and it was weird because the, there was part of me that was like, you're going to kill this, right? But I had no, it was not exciting. And I was trying to figure out why. And I went in there and I smashed that thing, like just talking. I could see myself from like another thing, just like do, going through the motions, but like killing it, but then being kind of detached, you know? Sure enough, I got it. When I got the phone call, it was like, it wasn't like, oh snap and you know whoever it was I like, called it might have been Alan was like so hyped on the other line and I was like okay keep it up keep it up but it never felt right and this is what I was saying earlier about like dude sometimes things are coming into your life and you're saying yes for all the reasons other than what you ought to be saying yes to it for honestly and in this case it maybe was an amalgamation of I'm going through all this stuff in my life let me do something new to reaffirm my prowess and hosting because I need that. I need that confidence boost right now. Or maybe it's like, I want to make your sister happy because she's done so much for me. But when it's not your heart's like truest desire, no matter how many things conspire to bring something into your lap and it's not supposed to be, it's not going to happen. And so, dude, we like started with a promo and all that stuff. And like all this series of crazy shit started happening. Like the TV station at the time had hired this person. He ended up having a heart attack or passing away and then nobody was pushing it. And it just all kind of like fell apart. That's how I knew I was not aligned anymore. And I needed to take a break somehow. I think this is where we've all kind of gone through that feeling where you just not feeling it, the whole world could have that good vision or good intentions for you. If that's not you and it's not your identity or you're not authentic to that, it doesn't feel right. Even though on the outside, it looks so perfect and glamorous, right? You know, and it's hard to explain because on the outside, when you're making certain moves, it looks like, what are you doing? This is what everyone wants. I'm sure, Sarah, at some point, everyone wanted to be the top model of host. But at some point, if it's not aligned to what your heart's true desire is, things may not feel good. Uh, just going back to the lessons Joey was teaching us. At the time, trust me, you do not understand what he's saying. When you're starting your career and you're looking around and seeing everyone kind of work, you're comparing yourself, right? So at some point, you're not thinking about feeling good. You're like, I want that job too. I want that cover too. I want that. So a lot of my focus was on other people, what they were doing. And I wasn't focusing on how I could feel good and feel better. Not understanding that the secret to that success and to vibrate on that level and to attract that was actually feeling good first and yeah. coming from that place of alignment. And now in hindsight, you realize, oh, everything that they were saying was true. It has to start with you first, your inner happiness, your inner journey, your inner peace. And then everything externally is a manifestation of how you're feeling. Your energy, your happiness will vibrate externally, and then the universe will deliver that. That's why personal development, self-development, healing, they're all the same thing. You know, healing is not linear and healing is never finished. Like you never go, I am healed. And like shit's like hunky dory forever after. Like nah, dog, you're going to be working at this until your last breath. If you choose to acknowledge that there's work to be done sort of on that level, then you do. 
and it's not fun and it's not pretty. And a lot of times it requires an understanding how the outside and the physical can garner sort of like this momentum in your life that also feels great, but simultaneously trying to match it by as much as I'm projecting outward, I need to be doing the work inward as well, which sometimes it's tough to do at the same time. And so, you know, what I've realized kind of over the past few years is I find myself repelling people that are mobilizing in this sort of like high frequency outward only, where it's like their entire existence depends on the image or the likes or the social media, and they're not doing the equal amount of work coming inward. If it's your time to learn, life will throw you shit to make you learn. In my case, that was pregnancy. That was getting pregnant with Kaya. That was like the, the breaks, like the like hard ass screeching halt. Greatest lessons ever, coming a mother. It was interesting when I, soon after, like they talk a lot about like morning sickness and like all these things, aversion to smell. But what I found most profound after a few weeks pregnant was my mama bear instincts just kicked in. And it's like my body knew what I needed to do that I wasn't able to do prior, which was cut off toxic ass people that were like really close to me, being very intentional about like the people that I was letting into my life, the energy that I was letting into my life, right? I felt so vulnerable that I couldn't have any bad energy around me. That was like my wake up call where it's like, you know, mother nature has my back, right? She knows like all of this, this is your big time out because you're going down a path that you are, are no longer aligned. Sarah is also very important in my life coaching journey because back then when we had a radio show and we got moved from an afternoon slot, like some random time slot, we got moved to the morning show. And I remember that pressure and anxiety, like, what are we going to do? But also excitement. And I felt safe being around Sarah because I knew that Sarah's a leader. So I knew that I was safe in her hands. And I knew that she would know where to take the show. And Sarah was very integral for deciding that we would have life coaching on the show. I think it was you who said it out loud. Literally, we were at a table. You were like, we should get a life coach. And then I think someone beside us knew a life coach. It was one of those things. Like in the same table, the person beside us was like, oh, I know a life coach. And you're like, what? So we were connected to Coach Pia Acevedo. And she became our life coach on the show. And we said, okay, for us to be able to promote this consciousness of positivity, self-development, self-awareness, life coaching, we should be the guinea pigs. And when I said we should be the guinea pigs, it was Sarah saying that, oh, okay, following, I was like, oh, okay, I guess we're going to do this. So Sarah went in first. She dove right in, had her session, came back to me to the station the next day, and then I said, Sarah, how was your session? And then she looked at me and she said, Vicky, everything's connected. And it was so intriguing that I said, okay, I want to get a session too because of your like, endorsement of that experience. And I was like, okay, I want to learn this too. And that changed my life already. Just getting into life coaching as someone being coached. And I think I started going on that journey for two years, just receiving coaching for two years before I left the country, before I moved to Singapore. But that was integral to the work I'm also doing now. Not knowing that that moment of just sitting on the table and then Sarah going, we should get a life coach. And then it happened because it's also something that I know you wanted to bring to the surface in terms of aligning as well the values and inner values to the external facade as well. Yeah, just for anyone listening, if you heard anything on air at that time, I think it was 2009, in terms of life coaching being on radio, that was Sarah Meyer. Bringing consciousness, self-awareness to mainstream media. But I mean, we really have to give Coach Pia a chunk of the recognition and the credit because she, she met us where we were at. She was the right person to come on that show. She was gregarious and she loves herself. Her energy was so contagious and desirable. It made you think like, well, damn, she's been through all this shit in her life and she seems like she turned out fine. And, you know, we're kind of, you know, 20-somethings coming like really in our feels like it's all about us and why is the world like this? having her as an introduction to life coaching, we started high. Like we got some good people in our life. I wanted to bring that up just for the sake of saying that as the world is feeling all these feelings of fear and uncertainty and anxiety, just going back to those practices 
of self-awareness and self-development and understanding your trauma, which we're going to talk about later. It's kind of nice to go back to foundations that keep you stable and it builds that inner strength as you're going through your own personal battles and now the world is going through its own shifts, right? Knowing that you can apply these things to any industry. So we were bringing it to radio, but we're also bringing it to this company through meditation, bringing it to the podcast, just seeing where you can bring kind of these lessons to share that helps people. I want to ask Sarah maybe a little bit about Parmada. So Sarah was our creative director at a startup online retail that basically was five, 10 years too early for the Philippines. I want to know actually, like when you were a creative director, did you know how to be a creative director at that time? Because right now I'm acting as creative director. So I just wanted to see if you could teach me anything that you learned from your experience and just how that whole experience went down. Yeah, well, it was because I brought Alyssa on board too to help us. She was bask and I was like, let's just bask in like our, like marinate. Yeah. And it's one of those moments where it's kind of like, they say fake it till you make it. My version is feign it till you rain it. And Louie coming down and having that meeting at apartment 1B and saying, look, this is, what's, this is what's going down and we want you on board. Up until that point, like I had started a production company and creative agency. So I had appointed myself creative director of that. So I thought I knew what it meant, but in the world of a startup, it's you're that and so much more. From my experience taught me about being creative director is a truly successful creative director is equal parts a creative visionary, but equal parts sort of like a lover of process, a people, a team, like understanding, not necessarily a team person or a team player, but understanding their role and dynamic within a team, within team setting and being able to like manage that flow, creating systems around the unique people that you have in your group, but also understanding what the bottom line is. At the end of the day is the vision for the business on a financial end as well. It's like, what are we putting into the world and how is it coming around back to us? What is our cycle? What does our ecosystem look like? Um, So the creative director, I think, does all of that, like a little bit of all of that. And whatever you find yourself thriving in, like I think creative directors should feel free to shape their role as their unique intersections and talents and skill sets and network boost them to be and to provide, you know? Did you enjoy that time in Formata? You really did. Like, it was tough because it was my first foray into sort of like a nine to five. It was fun. Like, and it went through its like kind of phases as well. And that's what happens when you're just way too early. The vision is way too early for the market. Philippines relationship and trust around systems and trust around credit card and financial and delivery. Like it was all broken trust. So our product, which needed those as pillars, couldn't click. But the energy of a startup, especially when you're that much advanced, is like, holy shit, I'm in a room with people that are thinking that much ahead, just like me, like we're kind of on the same page. And it was exciting. I think it just got difficult when the startup starts losing sort of like that fuel and that momentum. And then it's like, okay, the investment and like sort of the earnings, like you're kind of coming to this place now where you kind of reckon maybe we got to cut budget for this and cut budget for that. And so that was a huge, great lesson in like where and how can you compromise for the greater vision? At what point do you let go? It came to the point where not only was I working as creative director, but I was sort of like general manager as well. Like I was overseeing fulfillment and like all the different components, buying um, the merch. It was a crash course in a lot of great facets of the potential of being a creative in this like hustle industry. What do you think if uh, Pormato would have made it until now? I think Pormata should start back up now. <laughs> and right? I, no, that's, that's what I was thinking too, to be honest. Yeah, it's time. Now it's time. Now I think people are ready. And I think that just with the knowledge that we have and sort of like proof in the pudding of what has, what has worked internationally, and this is what I'm saying, you know, like it's this COVID situation, this pandemic has been so like all across the spectrum and experience for people, right? You have people that are really, really suffering, very real and tragic way suffering. And then you have people that are like, I know my clarity, my calling, everything is so crystal clear. I need to live a more sustainable life. I need to be more selective about what I'm bringing into my life in terms of like people and energy. People are now ready for that new you, right? People are ready for the next, as we like to say, for the next theory, right? 
it's going to be extremely pivotal for any industry with, that deals with physical product and that deals with getting that to people. So Permata in terms of like selection of things that you're putting out into the world, I think, you know, curating that would look a lot different than it did back then. But uh, how are you getting good stuff to, to people in a timely way, you know, like in a relevant way? What I wanted to talk about from your story about having a different title you're comfortable in the world of being a host, being a model and that sort of thing. And then shifting your role to being a creative director. So it was a lot of business, a lot of production, a lot of behind the scenes work also. Did you ever struggle with imposter syndrome when you shifted roles? And how did you manage that? So what was really interesting was there was no imposter syndrome at Permata. The joy about that was it was so new to everybody that it was kind of like you could write the rules as you go. There was no, there was no predecessor. There was no pressure, no expectation, because it's like we're kind of inventing this thing as we go along. The imposter syndrome truly, truly hit when, when I became editor-in-chief of Metro. That was the sort of like, this is a magazine that's going on three decades of existence. There have been very storied and revered editors that have sat in this seat and molded Metro from this like political lifestyle magazine into like a full-fledged fashion beauty luxury magazine. So, you know, it was just a great span of women that had sat in that seat. And I had not had a lick of publishing experience in my life. You know, I spoke about this at my talk in New York, where it's just like all of a sudden, you know, you're going from Instagram to, oh my God, this is being circulated to like hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's kind of a different ball game now because there were so many traditions and values and things set in place for the Metro brand. I was coming into an existing thing versus Promata where we were building it as we went. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Everybody on my team had like vast experience in whatever it is they did, years and years of experience. And here I was like first day supposed to steer the ship for everybody. And I was just like, oh my God, they don't trust me yet. I got to earn that trust, which would become a recurring theme sort of for me as a leader over the course of the next few years for, for Metro and for She Talks as well. When it came to your experience in Metro Magazine, how are you able to build your vision for Metro and make it the Sarah Meyer thumbprint? I was blessed to have a few crazy ass talented individuals on my team that had been raring for an opportunity to let loose, like let shit fly. At the end of the day, Metro is it's an ABS CBN product. And ABS CBN has a very clear understanding of who they are and how they are positioning themselves in all their formats, from TV to publishing, everything. It's a tried and tested and true system. When you break it down to the amount of talent that runs through the hallways of ABS CBN, like there are some phenomenally outlandish creative people that have just sort of learned to come together on a vision and make that happen. The same goes for what we did at Metro. There was a flow before I came on board, and there was a direction that they were going in that was utilizing sort of these key players. And so. I was able to vibe out people, where they're at in life, what their talent is, what they need in their life at that current point. So there's some people on my team where I was getting the vibe like, they don't want to be here. Let me make it easy for them and like, let me continue challenging you. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you and you're going to hate it. Let's see if you want this bad enough to stay or if you're gonna snap because you're not supposed to be here anymore. And I had people leave. I think ultimately at the time it was like weird and awkward because I had just come on board, but I think in the long run we're all where we're supposed to be now. But there were people on my team that were like crazy visionaries, young, passionate, like uh, amazing. And I just kind of gave them like free reign. I'm like, go do you dude. And it would come back spot on gorgeous. They kind of like was aware of my vibe and what I wanted to go for and it, they just made it happen. How do you introduce yourself to people nowadays that you've just met? Because like, you've done so much. What is it now that you open up with as what you do? It's been hard because I've been just so in mama mode that I have not really stepped out. And it's been extremely interesting coming to the Bay Area because Brooklyn, I had already acknowledged and labeled it in my head as my soul city. This is where I'm supposed to be by my flow. It was like, I knew kind of what to expect. New York was very familiar to me. The Bay, I had always associated with it being somebody else's. There's so many people, I think, even in our immediate crew that kind of come in and out of the Bay Area. It was always theirs. It was like this culture and this world that I was not part of. And so coming here, that's, I also felt a little bit, Ooh, where's my place? Everything's so defined in terms of like what the Bay Area is supposed to be. Where do I find myself in this? 
few months reinventing what that means, kind of like letting go and letting God and seeing like what it pulls me to. And just in the past, I would say maybe three months, I've just clicked back into alignment, but I don't introduce myself as anything. And I think that's been this weird social experiment where it's like, for the first time in my life, revel in conversation with a human that is just treating me like any other human and seeing what kind of quality conversation we have from there. And then what happens is they'll like look for me on Instagram and be like, wait, why do you have so-and-so, you know, many followers? What do you do? And then the light drizzle of like, this is what I used to do. And I'm still discovering what's now. The Instagram bio is like, how does this register? Does this best represent me and where I'm at now? But, but yeah, so you'll see me. Sometimes I'm like every tag of everything that I'm involved in. And then I'll just rip that all off because it's like, that doesn't represent who I am. For sure. And I think in the journey of being human, you will touch different things and be different people. And you're allowed that growth. No one said you had to have one identity the whole time. I mean, there's going to be that core of who you are. As you go through the different projects, you also build out and you grow and you learn from them. And that adds to your identity. And I think that's one of the reasons why I resist Instagram so much because I always felt like I was trapped. Like I'd have to be one thing, but now learning like you have the power to also change and shift as you go through transitions. So speaking of transition, Sarah, you've gone from MTV VJ, a creative director of Pramada, editor-in-chief, CEO of She Talks. How do you handle these transitions? What qualities did you have to be able to navigate all of that? I think it helps being a third culture kid to begin with. I itemized sort of like my my bloodlines and my heritage early at the beginning of the show. And then being born in Hong Kong and you never really have a comfort zone. You know, I went to the German Swiss International School for the first good chunk of my life in Hong Kong. And I mean, there was a whole gamut in a rape. Everybody was kind of sort of the same and that we were all kind of like mixed blood and we spoke German for whatever reason and like English. And we had like these multiple identities would constantly find ourselves in situations where you kind of just have to learn how to vibe. Right. And then, you know, later on going to IS in Manila, there are kids coming in and out of your school all the time. And it's not a homogeneous society within your school walls, right? Not everybody looks the same. Everybody's got something different to offer, different life perspective, different backgrounds. And you couldn't associate or label any of these prejudices on someone based on how they look because nobody looked like one thing. And so I think that made for a very sort of smooth, transient, migratory, sort of like diplomat kind of environment where you kind of learn to be a chameleon in many regards. If you really want to break it down to race, like in the Philippines, I don't necessarily look Filipino, but I can hang with my MTV crew and just be one of the production team and speak the way they do and then transition and go to Switzerland and kind of fit in there as well. But at the same time, you kind of fit in everywhere, but you never really fit in anywhere. And so you just have to make home wherever it feels right. Touching more on that question, of the many places that you called home, you said Manila keeps calling you back, but Brooklyn is like your soul city. Where is home for you now? If you had asked me this maybe eight months to a year ago, I wouldn't have said home is here, but now home is here. I'm so grateful that it's come to this phase and this chapter because there was a lot of resistance. People probably don't know, but we were in New York because my husband, John, is in the cannabis industry. The time and the need for him to be on the West Coast, it was like so now. Kai and I had just moved to New York, just moved into Brooklyn. We had our place together. I love that apartment. We were in the heart of Bed-Stuy, just living our life. John started having to come to the West Coast so much more. And then it was like, okay, well, this isn't how we'd imagine it. You know, we're finally living together after how many years of long distance? What are we going to do? He's like, okay, I'll be bi-coastal. So he was doing the traveling back and forth. And then we found out I was pregnant with Juno and he was very staunch about, I want to be with you the whole time. This is really where my heart and my opportunity is. So then it became a question of, do I pull Kaya out of her? She was in her zone. She was flowing. We had found an incredible school for her and she was just thriving in all the ways. And so it really became like this whole blended family convo where, well, what do we do? What's in everybody's best interest? And so Kaya's father, Banjo, moved to New York to, to be with her um, and be the excellent father that he is. And, you know, I was now able to be here 
far away from Paya, but that one year that we had together in Brooklyn prepared us for this. We were so tight. Like we had really just connected and bonded. And I felt like I was preparing her for something. It turned out to be this, that she would have to be far away from me, but she was like rock solid foundation. I think she's in a good place. And then I was able to just really be here. So speaking of Kaya, we know how your relationship with her, but it's interesting to see how your daughter is also influencing you and your decisions. I remember a long time ago, she helped influence you with social media posting. And now she's also influencing you with is it sustainable fashion? Can you talk about that? Yeah. So she was really, you know, I think it's part of being in her generation where they're born into this world and her attitude was very much like, you guys left us with this bullshit and very sort of emotionally attached. Like Kai is a, an indigo child and she's, you know, people say old soul and, and sensitive and an empath and all these things. But really when it boils down to it, she felt very deeply about the environment. And I found this out because, you know, I had started doing a parenting like column for Metro and, you know, I asked Kai permission, like, is it okay if I interview you? you and make it into an article. She's like, yeah, I think this will be great exercise. So she was actually about to fly back to New York. And so we were in the nursing bathroom at SFO airport and I'm breastfeeding Juno and I'm interviewing Kaya and it's recording, right? And, you know, I, I was asking her some hardcore questions for a teenager. Like, how did you feel when, you know, parents split up? Do you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick somehow? Do you feel like you're getting greater perspective? Because it's like doubled, like two different, you know, worlds that you're living in. She's answering like this. And then I say, why do you care about the environment so much? And that's when she kind of like shifted, the energy shifted and she just started sobbing. This generation feels so deeply and understands on such an intimate level, like the energy exchange between them and the planet that I think we've been really oblivious to because of like, what I don't know, media, capitalism, whatever it is. And so she started making her own toothpaste. She started making her own deodorant and shampoo and just kind of like really turned our like little Brooklyn apartment. And like she had like her compost situation. It was really diligent about all of these things that it made me realize like that one of the greatest gifts that I could leave her was a habitable planet, but that it was also, she was the biggest lesson in bringing me closer to nature and bring like me closer, like more home, I, I guess you could say. Awesome. Honestly, this is too good. Thank you, Sarah. I don't think we can honestly get this all down in one app. So I think we got to let that marinate and come back for more. Because, well, this is our show and we can. Sarah, again, thank you so much for sharing all those experiences. And I mean, a lot of those things are stuff that, at least for me, on my behalf, I, I've never really got to understand so much. So thank you for sharing us with your light. And can't wait to have you back for part two. So everyone stay tuned because we're going to do this again with Sarah. And hopefully you guys can come along with us for that ride here on Theoretically Speaking. So don't forget to follow at Sarah underscore Meyer. And while you're at it, follow us too at Next Theory, at Victoria Herrera, and myself at Brent Javier.